Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming tonight on a Friday night. Um, we are very excited to have Mihai Lucas, our current artist in residency here, to share with us some of his recent research on Roma slaves in relation to archives, cultural production, capitalism, and um, Roma futurism. Well, we decided a couple of days ago to add in a performative element into today's lecture, uh, which became the video that you see here at the background. The video will be played alongside with Mihai's lecture today. So without further ado, I'll pass the mic to Mihai. So this was a performance uh, related somehow to to this research that I will present to you tonight. Uh, this research um, spans over the last two years that I worked on. Uh, it's connected uh, to a very specific uh, historical um, situation in uh, connected to Romania and to Eastern Europe, and I will try somehow to uh, present uh, this context uh, to understand better what I will talk about. Um, so I will have this uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation that will play uh, in parallel with the video. Um, and you will see, I mean, somehow the video is connected to this presentation and is connected especially uh, to a part of this presentation. So um, I will talk about uh, first the context and the concepts that I'm working with. Then I will uh, explain a bit more about the performative slaves. Uh, then move to the musical slaves and end uh, with uh, a small uh, introduction to the theme of uh, industrial slaves uh, that I worked on recently, but it's still just uh, a beginning of this uh, research. And um, actually, I worked um, on this uh, topic of uh, uh, pre-capitalist uh, fantasies about uh, the coming capitalism to Eastern Europe uh, from the 19th century and uh, what was uh, the place of the Roma in all these stories. Um, I worked here basically and I somehow prepared before, uh, before coming to Hong Kong, but this research will, uh, this part of my research will continue. Okay, um, so about the context and the concepts that uh, I'm working with. Um, first of all, uh, is this uh, concept, this big chunk of history called Romani slavery? Um, I use uh, the term Romani, uh, which is different than Romanian, right? So uh, we are talking about Roma people. We, uh, the term that is used in connection to slavery is Tsigan or Gypsy in English. Um, but um, the term that should be used is uh, Romani or Roma. So I would use both terms. Uh, they are very different. Uh, as an ethnic uh, group and their status uh, over history from uh, uh, the Romanian majority in two countries that I focus on, Wallachia and uh, Moldavia. So they were basically uh, slaves uh, for uh, 500 years uh, and um, their first mentioning uh, historically w uh, in uh, Wallachia and Mol uh, Moldavia was uh, slaves. And um, actually, this is a map uh, of Europe to uh, the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, when you still have this uh, institution of slavery, which was very important for the two small countries that uh, you can see close to the Black Sea, um, between uh, the Austrian uh, monarchy and the Ottoman Empire. 
those were like the two countries that uh, later formed uh, uh, Romania. Uh, and um, there were basically uh, three categories of slaves in these two countries. Um, these were like the state slaves or princely slaves. Uh, there were uh, the slaves uh, which belonged to monasteries, and they were the most significant part, I think. And then uh, the slaves belonging to a boyar. Uh, the boyar is the local noble in these uh, two countries. Uh, they were organized uh, by their trades. And um, their names uh, were given uh, in relation uh, to their uh, um, activities. So you would have uh, these bear tamers uh, that would entertain uh, the villages and so on, uh, traveling. Uh, uh, with the bear, but they were also like this uh, nomad, nomadic groups uh, of slaves. They were also uh, very strictly controlled, and uh, their situation was even uh, worse uh, than uh, home slaves. So um, we had different uh, categories, and uh, of course, the situation of these uh, categories changed a lot over the 500 years of slavery. But uh, in general, these are some of the main uh, groups. Then uh, at the middle of uh, 19th century, uh, there is uh, uh, slavery abolitionist movement, which was formed uh, especially by uh, the young uh, boyars, uh, the young uh, educated uh, nobles from uh, these two countries. And um, they uh, pushed this agenda of the abolition of slavery because um, their intention was to construct a modern Romanian nation in these uh, countries. And uh, they said that it's not possible to have a modern nation while we still have uh, this outdated institution of slavery, which is the institution of our parents, which is another generation, and we want to change that. So it was like this. Uh, progressive uh, movement. Um, I will come back to, um, to this uh, and um, to this uh, abolitionist movement. And we'll see how uh, it affected like, the specific uh, groups of slaves that I uh, will talk about tonight. Um, and um, it's a uh, it's also important to say that uh, this uh, modern Romanian nation formed at the, at the same time as uh, slavery abolitionism. So there were like two uh, separate processes that happened together somehow at the same time. So these two countries, Wallachia and Moldova, united, and they formed a new country, Romania. and. Um, these two processes uh, actually were very much interlinked. The um, abolition of slavery and the um, unification of these two countries, which created a new nation. OK. Uh, so basically, this is how they were represented. Uh, these boyars, these young nobles, um, and um, while uh, they were uh, talking about slaves and uh, writing a lot uh, on uh, the condition, the bad condition of the Romani population and how um, this institution of slavery has to disappear, they focused a lot on uh, cultural slaves. Uh, 
and especially on Romani musicians and uh, performers, because uh, in their opinion, uh, these uh, groups uh, were actually uh, the keepers uh, of a traditional Romanian uh, folkloric culture. So, um, Um, in uh, my research, I also deal a lot with archives and how uh, one can work with these archives. How do we deal with archives as researchers, so as artists? And um, there are um, some questions that we ask ourselves where we are dealing, especially with these archives that present a very violent past. And how um, do we deal with these uh, histories? And uh, how um, do we work with uh, <coughs> this violent past, which is also very um, emotionally charged nowadays for the majority? and also for the uh, Romani population in Romania is a very difficult topic to address. So um, I, uh, I was very much inspired by the work of uh, Canali and Fuentes. Uh, and um, another important concept that I work with in relation to archives of slavery is, is uh, critical fabulation. And uh, it's, um, it's a concept that somehow um, explains or tries to find an answer to this uh, paradoxical relation to, to the archive, which is also a place of possibility, but also um, a place of failure because um, we are very limited when we work with archives and uh, it's very difficult actually to bring uh, this experience uh, from, from this collection of documents and how do we deal with this information, what do we do with it and so on. I mean, there are like a lot of questions we ask ourselves, and most of the times we don't have answers. So um, about uh, critical fabulation, it's a concept introduced by uh, Saidia Hartman. And um, it's, um, it's a method, mainly, of working with uh, archives of slavery. And um, it's an approach. Um, that we um, we can use actually. I mean, for me, it's uh, it's somehow very practical. I mean, what she explains is very practical in the terms that I work with different archives of slavery. She works with uh, African American archives of slavery. Um, the contexts are very different in a way. Um, but um, how we deal with uh, with all this death and suffering, which is contained uh, in in these documents, uh, it's it's a very difficult way. Sometimes you just don't want to deal with it anymore. So I think she comes with uh, with some good uh, answers to this um, dilemma, actually, like this methodological dilemma. I think um, when we are talking about uh, Romani slavery and the modernization of the Romanian nation, um, we are talking a lot about uh, the situation of the Romani people nowadays in Europe. And um, 
these relations between um, Romani and non-Romani people. Um, and in this uh, process of uh, discussing common histories, because when we talk about uh, Romani slavery, it's not only about Roma people or Romani people, it's also about the majority, it's also about uh, the slave owners, and it's also about uh, the peasants that live close by and basically in the same communities with different statuses and so on. Um, it's a common history that uh, we still don't know how to handle, and it's still very much uh, present uh, in contemporary discussions related uh, to Roma realities. And um, this, uh, <clears throat> this institution of slavery was very important at that time, um, also in terms of uh, intellectual debates, because um, these young uh, nobles, young boyars, intellectuals, and so on, um, they were very much interested in asking uh, these subjectivity questions. Who are we as a nation? Uh, what are our origins? How do we deal with the past? And uh, of course, uh, the, main, uh, the main question was, uh, about the future, you know, what will we become? Um, and all these ideas are very much related to Romani people and um, how they were perceived uh, as a property at that time. Um, it's very much related to um, ideas of tradition, which was a new thing. So tradition is also an invention of modernity. Um, and uh, this, even uh, this uh, tradition of slavery was invented also during the 19th century when all these debates about uh, the possibility of uh, abolitionism came. So, um, in uh, these discussions, uh, an important element uh, that comes up uh, is uh, Europeanness and this idea that we are Europeans and uh, how can we have slaves uh, here in Europe? I mean, that was also a question asked by uh, Westerners traveling to Romania. And it's very interesting because, I mean, they were not um, so uh, shocked that slaves existed uh, and uh, people are using slaves and so on because there were still, I mean, you still have colonies, you have um, slave trade and so on, uh, but the shock for them, for these French and British uh, travelers, was that it was so close, that it was only three days uh, traveling from Paris, and uh, it was not somewhere far beyond the sea in the colonies, it was right here, so close to us. And um, that was l like the main problem for them. How can we be Europeans? How can we still have slaves uh, and be part of Europe? So uh, they were trying also to answer this, uh, these uh, questions. Um, and um, there were also questions that are very much uh, present nowadays uh, in the discussions uh, related to uh, Romanian and Romani subjectivity. There, there was, and there is still this uh, um, 
like rejection of uh, the Romani population. There is a strong racism going on in Europe and uh, the Romani minority, European as a European minority, is uh, probably the last uh, minority in Europe um, for which uh, racism is still acceptable. And that's very problematic in a way. And we can see these examples uh, taking place nowadays in Ukraine, where you have pogroms against the Roma people. Just last week, uh, we have shootings in Italy and the strong discourse against uh, Romani people based on their uh, ethnic uh, characteristics and based on um, this 19th century um, ideas of racism, um, which still exist in Romania, of course, where we have still like the biggest uh, Romani population in Europe. Um, so uh, I put here just some uh, of the ideas that uh, are related uh, to how uh, Romani people are treated. Um, and uh, one element, especially when it comes uh, as a positive uh, interaction, is, uh, is this Roma exoticism, which is also very problematic um, because it's a form of uh, dehumanization of the uh, Romani people. Um, and uh, you can see these uh, uh, presentations or these uh, representations uh, in the media and uh, in art and so on, in fashion. Um, and um, they're very similar somehow to uh, to these exotic representations from the 19th century. Um, so there is definitely a fascination with the lifestyle of the Roma people, um, which are seen as the other in Europe. And um, there is a relation of uh, what I call extimacy, which is a term taken from Lacan, um, this external intimacy. Um, a structure which is in uh, between different subjects. Um, well, the other uh, tells a lot about who I am, and I construct myself. I construct my own subjectivity uh, through uh, the other. So, yeah, this is Lacan uh, you, explaining this. Uh, this concept. Uh, so the other, the Roma person is always uh, present, is always there in the discussion, in the process of uh, constructing the non-Roma subjectivity. Another concept that, that I will just mention here uh, is from Hegel, uh, and uh, it's this master-slave dialectics uh, that uh, this is just a meme with Hegel. This is very popular nowadays. I don't know why. Uh, and um, this uh, master position as a primitive consciousness. Um, and uh, it somehow, I mean, for me, it was very close to to this Lacanian concept of extimacy. And uh, somehow it uh, helped me understand uh, this relation um, in the construction of subjectivity. And uh, another important concept that I use, and it's uh, 
It's called Gageology. It was introduced uh, by the Roma scholar Petra Gelber. That's her. She's also a musician. Um, and uh, it's connected uh, to, to this uh, concept of the Gage. It's how Roma people call the others. And uh, she is also using gageology. She's proposing this as a method um, to use the constructions, the theoretical construction, uh, with the subject-object positions reversed. So, um, in a sense, um, my research uh, and what I wrote so far uh, is an exercise uh, in uh, in this geological reading of uh, uh, the slavery archives, and um, I'm basically trying to avoid uh, a basic mistake that is done in. Uh, uh, Romani studies, so all this research that is done related to Roma people. Um, and um, this, this mistake is um, this exaggerated focus on the difference, on the Roma difference, how Roma people are so different than us, uh, the non-Roma, um, how uh, we are talking about uh, Roma problems, uh, which are totally outside uh, of uh, a common context. Uh, and um, uh, Petra Gelber proposes this idea of reversing the case, which is very important. This is taken from um, a feminist uh, theory. And um, I think it's, it's a very powerful tool in uh, dealing with these texts, which, first of all, are written, uh, these texts connected to Roma slavery, they are written by non-Roma. So all these abolitionists are uh, basically um, discussing uh, Roma condition and Rom Roma sub subjectivity, uh, sometimes totally detached uh, from actual Roma people. And we can also see in the visual representations uh, of the time, because also painters and artists uh, were trying to, um, for example, actors that were embodying Roma characters, not being Roma themselves. But I'll, I will give you an example um, at some point. And um, they are also uh, imagining this Roma. Uh, people that they didn't know, actually, even if they were living together in the same place. Um, so uh, basically, we we are doing, actually, in, in Gageology, we are reversing uh, this question. So the question that we should ask about Roma, we ask to non-Roma. And in to this relation. So it's more like a, an intellectual game, let's say, when reading a text and you put the questions in the opposite way than expected. Um, so one of the premises of geology is this minority-centric perspective that can work at the bigger level to society. Um, and um, the, the purpose uh, is to, to have a better perspective of the, uh, this uh, inter-ethnic dynamic and to increase reflexivity on both uh, sides. Um, So, um, 
In the period that I'm focusing on, 1830s, 1860s, there are numerous descriptions of Roma people. And um, these descriptions uh, come as a method uh, because they were published at that time. They were published in newspapers, in journals, in books, and so on. Um, they were very active in the sense of uh, publishing. So um, what they were trying to do basically was to um, produce empathy. I mean, that was their plan, to produce empathy to their families, to uh, the slave owners, because they were coming from the same category, the same social category, and um, how to... Uh, to create uh, this change, this social change of uh, um, not having slaves anymore, uh, their, uh, their uh, proposal was basically to change the mentality of the slave owners. So they would uh, realize that uh, it's such a big uh, mistake to have slaves and uh, the situation will change. Of course, it didn't happen like this, historically. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, we have now uh, a lot of written materials from that period. Um, so um, they focused on this uh, cultural categories um, and uh, this uh, house uh, slaves uh, that were uh, very much uh, present uh, in uh, um, in the life of the noble family, uh, they still had uh, these uh, performers uh, that were not anymore. I mean, in the nice. Century, they were not anymore uh, these court gestures like the clowns that we know and so on, but um, there were different uh, forms of entertainment like magicians, uh, like uh, um, acrobats, uh, clowns, and so on. I mean, they, they, they were present, they were present, and uh, um, for uh, for these young nobles, they were uh, basically um, capturing a form of a traditional culture uh, that they appreciated. So um, they were using these uh, positive examples of musicians and uh, gestures in order to to grow sympathy um, in society uh, and to produce uh, this, uh, this social uh, movement. Um, in, um, in producing uh, a social movement like uh, the abolitionist movement, uh, they were very much influenced uh, by other abolitionist movements from uh, United States, from France, uh, from Britain, and um, they were um, trying basically to implement some of these uh, methods already tested um, in other uh, places. Um, but uh, as I said already, their method was different. They focused on mentality, on creating uh, a public opinion. While, while for example, in France, uh, the abolitionist movement was quite different. Uh, they were trying basically uh, to focus uh, on uh, slave revolts to support uh, economically and uh, uh, technically these uh, revolts. and. Uh, the abolitionist movement in France was uh, based uh, mainly on uh, secret, vasi secret societies, which was not the case in uh, Romanian countries, in Wallachia and Moldova, because uh, uh, they were um, they were basically going for the highest. Uh, possible visibility and uh, 
they were, for example, uh, organizing big events uh, for slave owners who uh, decided to uh, free their slaves. So they would be seen as heroes and uh, they would write a lot about these people. Oh, look how great uh, that they free their slaves. Um, but it was, uh, these examples were actually very small, were irrelevant on the whole scale. So um, the change came um, basically from the state, uh, and it was not uh, based on uh, on these uh, abolitionist ideas of the time, uh, but uh, they basically, when they created these new institutions, uh, like these state institutions, they basically needed more taxpayers. And uh, the slaves, the Roma slaves were paying, of course they were paying a lot of taxes, uh, but they were paying to their uh, owners, to the nobles, to the uh, church, and so on. So uh, basically the state uh, had uh, this, uh, uh, this idea of uh, freeing the slaves and transforming them into citizens and uh, taxpayers. So that was what basically happened. So um, now uh, I'll talk about uh, these gestures, just uh, a few things. Um, so they were basically mentioned for the first time uh, in uh, Valachia uh, and uh, by this uh, ruler, Petru Churchill, uh, and he was uh, inspired by the jokes uh, uh, from the court of uh, Henry III of Valois. Um, this is him and uh, the other guy is uh, uh, Henry III. Um, and um, these gestures uh, from the start were uh, chosen exclusively from uh, Romani slaves, from the group of Romani slaves. Um, and they slowly became uh, a symbol of uh, Romanian theater, of traditional Romanian theater. Um, their, um, <coughs> their ethnicity, um, was uh, basically erased when they uh, were integrated into this uh, history, and um, and uh, also their uh, lowest status uh, in as uh, slaves. I mean, the gestures was were like the lowest uh, possible uh, slaves. Uh, and uh, and gestures were only Roma slaves. That's also important. So this uh, this job was exclusively reserved uh, to Roma people. And there were quite a lot actually of gestures. Like all boyars who owned slaves, they also had gestures uh, because the ruler had a gesture then the big boyars had gestures and so on so basically in all the families you boyar families you would have um, this uh, this character um, so uh, I'm using this uh, citation um, from uh, Vasil Alexandri, he was one of the abolitionists and a very important writer and uh, politician in uh, in Romania. Um, and uh, he was basically writing uh, about these uh, um, symbols uh, in relation, actually, to his generation. I mean, to his generation of uh, intellectuals and politicians that um, he was saying that uh, they're just a collection of uh, comic caricatures uh, and they have a ridiculous seal on their generation 
uh, and uh, he's comparing with uh, other uh, European culture. Uh, and it's very interesting that he's using for the Romanian, uh, uh, I don't know, character, uh, Vasilake the Gypsy. Vasilake the Gypsy uh, is a very important character. Uh, we still have uh, Vasilake nowadays, uh, especially in puppet theater, in traditional puppet theater, and is the like this Roma character. Very similar to the medieval gesture, to the medieval uh, Romani gesture. And um, it's very interesting that Alexandri writes about him uh, in, another, uh, in another text, uh, how uh, he drops his, et uh, how Vasilake drops his ethnic uh, characterization. He's not Roma anymore uh, because uh, Abolition of slavery meant also a process of uh, becoming Romanian. So the former slave would not be a slave uh, by becoming a new Romanian. And this happened also with this character. And uh, uh, in, the, in this text, uh, Alexandri says that uh, Vasilake becomes a citizen and he becomes a landowner. Um, and he's basically raising his people from slavery through um, not being a Roma anymore. So this is a traditional representation of Vasilake and his wife, uh, Marijuara, and uh, they're a bit like a Punch and Judy couple, um, very violent. And uh, the humor is also very trivial. Uh, um, what, uh, what I wanted to say also about uh, the gesture and the names of the gesture, because um, there are different, in Romanian, there are different uh, Names used uh, for uh, for the gesture. The main one is maskarich, which comes from the mask, the masked one. Um, there, there is also this name karagios that comes from Turkish. It means black eyes, and uh, apparently these are uh, different uh, categories of gestures by different names and uh, their skills are a bit different. They are doing uh, other things, but they are part of the same group of this performative uh, pre-modern artists. So you also have this Manliech, which comes from the Greek uh, maniakos, uh, which bad and so on, uh, maniac. Um, because they were doing uh, magic tricks, uh, illusions, um, and uh, they were seen as very strange. Um, and their uh, um, attractions uh, were also kind of scary at that time. Um, here are some representation. This, uh, these two characters are the Karagios, uh, Karagios, the plural, I think. Um, and uh, they were basically these uh, jokers uh, uh, doing all kind of uh, tricks and farces and so on. Uh, here are other representations um, of gestures. Um, without masks. Um, other terms uh, are uh, connected to um, them being lazy or uh, they are very negative in a way. Like these terms are um, like the fool, which is the most common term uh, used in, uh, in Romanian also. And it's very similar to the fool from the tarot card, uh, which is also the alchemist. Um, tarot uh, was also traveling around uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, and in Romanian, the term is also very interesting. is nebun, which means not good. And it was like this nebun, this fool, was exactly what uh, 
society considered that is not good. And that was also the source of humor. Um, this is a representation, and, and actually this is the one, this is the engraving that I used also to have this tattoo dealing with the archive. Um, so you can see, I mean, it's a trivial, it's a trivial representation. It's farting, uh, but the posture, it's very similar to the fall from the tarot cards. You can see here. So, um, in a theater history of Moldavia, we we have these descriptions. I mean, we have in many other locations, but I I uh, choose this one um, because it's it's very clear how uh, they would be dressed, uh, these gestures, and these these were actually the the highest uh, gestures, they were the gestures of uh, the ruler, of the prince. Um, and um, what they were doing, basically, well, with these uh, coronations and these public events, uh, so they were basically screaming, yelling. Uh, they were also making a lot of sexual jokes. They were making fun of women. Uh, and uh, they would speak dirty. Uh, and uh, it was very common, I mean, this thing. Also, how um, they, that's the way how they would treat uh, other nobles when they were with the king, for example. So someone who was below uh, uh, their master, uh, their owner, they would just make fun of them. And especially if there was some conflict. Um, so uh, in other descriptions, uh, they are having uh, other outfits, for example, they have uh, large tiger for hats. Uh, they would have small mirrors in front of the hat. Uh, they would wear guns, uh, their waist or axes. Um, and um, about uh, about their jokes and uh, their uh, humor element. Uh, they um, they were making fun of the ruler in front, uh, or, or they were making fun of their owner of uh, of their master. Uh, but uh, this was seen of uh, of course uh, the humor was very limited. They could not make too much fun, um, but. Um, this was seen as a sign of benevolence, uh, and uh, they uh, they were make uh, the master uh, be more likable in the eyes uh, of uh, the family and in the eyes uh, of. Uh, of this uh, very hierarchical structure that was uh, the medieval society. Um, and the gesture basically had this uh, important social role uh, to uh, give voice to entire social categories that would not have a voice um, otherwise. So they would make these social jokes, these social scenes, uh, um, creating these situations where they would make fun of the master and the rulers. Um, so um, 
they were uh, basically producing uh, the only uh, theatrical performances of the time, uh, especially during parties, during these celebrations, um, with the uh, very uh, physical acts. Uh, they would uh, put themselves in uh, humiliating uh, positions, uh, situations, uh, in order to show how inferior they were uh, to the people present. Um, but they would also use wit, they would uh, also use spontaneity to make jokes about uh, the rulers and so on. Um, as I already said, they would use trivialities, uh, ironies, uh, and uh, and so on. Um, and uh, some of uh, these methods of creating humor, this vulgar, this slapstick comedy, is still common uh, in uh, some clowns uh, or in some forms uh, of uh, um, popular theater, and uh, even if uh, their status was uh, like uh, one of the lowest uh, in the um, social structure, um, like we have even in the laws, uh, in the Matei Basarab's law from 1652, if a man is surprising his wife cheating on him, and uh, if the cheater is a gesture, the man uh, can kill the gesture and nothing will happen. Um, that was the law. And um, even if uh, they had uh, this uh, very um, low social status, um, they are uh, represented uh, culturally. Uh, and for example, in the first uh, modern play uh, called Barbu Vacarescu, The Seller of the Country, by Odake Golescu, also Boyar, author, um, the central character is uh, a gesture, um, and he's explicitly named the Gypsy of Rakovitz, a, a boyar, like his owner. He's very present in the way that he's ridiculing the nobles. He's very witty. Uh, he's uh, expressing uh, uh, this uh, indignation uh, for big... Uh, uh, categories of people for peasants, for priests, uh, for uh, uh, small uh, bureaucrats in this uh, very corrupt system uh, that the play talks about. Uh, and of course, he's making also the well known uh, sexual trivial jokes in this play. So um, another uh, author, an important author um, in Romanian literature, Caragiale, had uh, an article at the end of the 19th century talking about the gestures uh, and how uh, they were recruited uh, from uh, the uh, slaves uh, and um, how uh, all the boyars, uh, they had uh, these gestures uh, which were um, present uh, at home parties together with the musicians, uh, the so-called lautari. Uh, they would uh, um, make these specific gest gesture jokes. Uh, they were... Uh, trick um, uh, the guests, they would make pranks, uh, and uh, they would even uh, have uh, 
is a very intimate role for boyars in sentimental circumstances. They would um, be present in this sexual relations that the boyars would have. Uh, but um, one of the main um, political tasks of the gesture was, uh, as explained by Karadja, very clear uh, how um, the gesture would be used by uh, his uh, slave owner um, and sent to make fun of the rival, to boo them, to throw garbage on them, uh, and to swear, basically. So they would send a gesture to to swear at the rival uh, noble. And uh, that was uh, very efficient somehow. Um, well, for, uh, for Caragiale, um, this uh, golden age uh, disappeared at the, at the end of the 19th century, and he thought that the role of the gesture was taken by the journalists um, at that time. Um, and um, the gestures um, were very much... Uh, present uh, in, uh, in this uh, cultural context. Uh, and uh, they influenced very much uh, the political humor. They influenced very much uh, the theater in uh, Romania. And uh, they also created a form of uh, critical political humor that uh, I think it's still uh, it's still present in a way in uh, in certain uh, performative situations, let's say. Um, and I think we can definitely consider this uh, Roma slave gestures, the founders of the room of the theater in the region, even if. This topic is basically unknown in Romania. People have no idea, not even Roma people, they have no idea that uh, these gestures were actually Roma slaves. Um, these are some photographs from the 30s, 1930s, and we can still see uh, this very similar um, style of the gesture, especially the, and the guy with the white pants. And uh, um, there are also like this uh, uh, folkloric uh, theater shows uh, where you would have this uh, gesture character, which is very interesting. These are some images that uh, I found um, at the um, a museum uh, of the Romanian peasant. Uh, they have a very interesting uh, visual archive, and they have like all these images related to uh, traditional theater. And you could see uh, so many elements uh, from uh, from these uh, forms of uh, performative. Uh, um, performative slavery, let's say, and uh, it, that are still present. And how uh, Roma people, you could see also in these images, uh, kept uh, this tradition of uh, of performing uh, in a in a very similar way to the medieval. Uh, performances of the gesture. So uh, now uh, I'll move quick uh, to the second category that uh, I will talk about, uh, the musical slaves, the lautari, I already mentioned before. Um, again, playing music was reserved only for Roma slaves. And um, in uh, in the first mentions of
in Wallachia and Moldova, these mentionings are about slaves, are about um, these Roma musicians um, who are sold in 1558 by uh, King Mircea the Shepherd. So we have uh, Ruste the Lothar who is sold to a steward from Moldavia. Then in 1565, the same steward uh, by the Roma group of slaves, uh, which includes this Tempa, the, the Lothar, the Roma musician. Um, it's important um, to say that um, Lautari had a very significant role um, in uh, the abolitionist movement. They are very much uh, talked about and um, they're also constructed as the other, as the person who knows very much, who um, actually uh, sings uh, our stronger, strongest emotions, our love stories, and so on, but he's not one of us. Um, and um, I want to tell you that one of the old uh, Lautari from Bucharest that, uh, that I met, uh, I don't know, it was like two years ago, he told me that uh, um, they are hated, the Lautari, they are hated by other Roma groups nowadays because uh, they were sitting at uh, the same table with the boyar, with the slave owner, and they would... Uh, wear his clothes and his shoes. And I mean, they were very intimate with the noble, of course, as a slave, but their situation was a bit different than uh, any other um, groups uh, of slaves. Um, so their um, subjectivity formation was very much influenced uh, by uh, by this uh, power structure by these very strict uh, but very close power structures which had also strong effects over the century um, I'm using this quote from Shannon Woodcock. Uh, she did a very good research uh, on uh, Roma slavery. She's a historian from Australia. Um, and um, it's very much related to, to this construction. I mean, the Lautare is very much uh, related to this construction of, um, of the Romanian identity, of the modern Romanian identity. And we have so many instances that these very important uh, historical events, there is always a uh, Lotari present. And um, the Lotari is also like the person who is uh, recording, who is keeping the uh, historical moment. Um, alive. Um, so, um, in uh, in terms of um, of this uh, modernization project uh, and uh, this uh, construction of a, a modern uh, Romanian uh, nation, um, so. This Lautar was uh, was the strongest uh, example of um, this reproduction of the self um, by uh, connecting cultural production and uh, proximity to the boyar. So. Uh, 
Yeah, so as, as I said, the, um, the Romanian representation of Romani people um, had a very important role in this identity construction. Um, for, uh, for the abolitionists, uh, the Lautari were the keepers of the uh, Romanian spirit through their music, uh, through their lyrics. Um, and um, this, uh, this text uh, that uh, constitute basically um, the main part of the, of the archive of, of this uh, archive of slavery that does not exist in one place. There are different locations where we can find this uh, abolitionist text, but um, this um, this text focus on uh, on these two elements mainly presenting the condition of the Roma slaves uh, and uh, how uh, this uh, future country where we all live together can be constructed and. Um, there was uh, one of the main uh, journals, uh, like abolitionist journals, was called Prosperity, and uh, it was published on green paper, uh, which was the color of hope uh, in 1844. And um, Mihail Kogalinchan, one of the most important uh, abolitionists, wrote in this uh, uh, this paper that was circulating quite a lot, um, that uh, these are somehow the principles. I mean, this is one of the principles of, uh, um, of the abolitionist movement. And there is also this constant comparison to the situation in France and uh, um, other um, countries uh, from Western Europe who had colonies. Um, so these arguments that they are pushing, uh, they are uh, very diverse and they are religious, they are e economic, uh, state building. Um, they talk about very general ideas like for the love of all people. But a very important element is this idea of the European synchronism, uh, where slavery is an outdated institution, and um, we should become more Euro European and uh, be part of the civilized world and uh, denounce slavery. Um, so this abolitionist discourse creates also differences between uh, various uh, slaves and um, puts a, a greater uh, importance on uh, the already assimilated uh, Romani slaves, uh, like uh, this called uh, Vatrash, which uh, the musicians are also a part of so, in a sense, uh, it's considered positive, uh, positive element that they forgot their language, that they lost their customs, uh, that uh, they are seen as the most civilized, and they deserve this freedom because they somehow lost their ethnic identity. Uh, also, after the abolition uh, of slavery took place, uh, Romanianization, this transformation of the former slaves into new Romanians was part of the uh, process, even if it was not very successful, um, because they didn't have the mechanisms to impose it. Um, there was a big discussion of this annihilation of the uh, Roma uh, cultural identity and uh, how uh, this 
idea of uh, being Roma means being a slave. So while you you become a free person, you become a Romanian who is not Roma, who is not a slave. So the, the, somehow they are moving within this logic. Um, and um, another uh, important uh, abolitionist, uh, Cesar Boliac, also poet and uh, uh, an army officer, uh, had this uh, poem, uh, A Gypsy Woman with Child at the Statue of Liberty in Bucharest, where this mother talks to her child and uh, she is uh, basically saying that um, Roma people have to forget uh, the 500 years of slavery. They have to um, show their gratitude uh, to their Romanian benefactors. And uh, uh, this should be taught to future Roma generations. So, uh, that uh, they should forget their humiliation and uh, just uh, be grateful because you accepted us as your equal. But already in this sort of <laughs> relation, you can see that the hierarchies are still at place. So. Uh, There is another example. I mean, these examples are so many and uh, so telling. Um, this is uh, from the 1848 revolution. This was a revolution that happened in many European countries uh, and also in Wallachia and Moldova. Um, and uh, part of this uh, revolution, um, which was like this bourgeois revolution, also um, led by the same intellectuals that were part of the abolitionist movement, uh, there were like large discussions about um, the conditions of the Roma slaves. And um, for example, Ion Ionescu de la Brad, one of these revolutionaries, uh, talks about uh, slavery uh, through the lautar and through the fiddle um, and how it's important to emancipate uh, the slave but also the peasants uh, which had also a very difficult situation but it was quite uh, different the situation of the peasants of the time and the situation of the uh, Roma slaves. Um, but they are trying basically to make this connection between the Roma slaves, uh, which were seen as lautari, and uh, the peasants. Um, these uh, bands of uh, lautari developed a lot uh, in the 18th century um, together with the cities, even though um, most uh, Boyer families had their own band, but uh, when the cities expanded, uh, also um, you have uh, schools of uh, musicians, uh, of Lautari musicians, uh, which, I, and all, all these uh, slaves were basically, uh, all these music musicians were basically slaves. Uh, so for example, when the king returned uh, to um, to Bucharest, to to the capital, he would be welcomed by 500 musicians playing their instruments. Um, so this is a 19th century representation of a. Um, a Boyer family, and you can see the musicians, how they are positioned. And, um, 
okay hold the jump on for some parts um, it is also important to say that Lotari this uh, Slaves, these musicians, these Roma musicians were the only producers of uh, musical culture and they were producing music basically. Um, okay, you have also these categories of, of church singers, but that was very different from uh, how, uh, how important their role was in. Uh, in society um, so they were also very much connected to the intimate life of their owner uh, they were uh, giving voice to their masters they would sing uh, uh, these love songs they would produce these love songs for their masters uh, and uh, they uh, they would also be the source of this strange situations where uh, the woman would fall in love uh, with a singer and uh, not the owner of the singer. Um, and uh, also how, um, how they were used. I mean, these uh, musicians um, are... Uh, are used also to keep a memory of the family. So all these um, important uh, events in the life of the family are kept by uh, by the musicians, by the by these slaves, which are always present in the life of the family, and they create songs about what is going on with this family. So these songs uh, are kept uh, and uh, are uh, transmitted uh, from uh, one generation to another. And uh, they, uh, they would be uh, this, this memory, actually, uh, of the family a uh, long time after, I don't know, the love story died and uh, um, these uh, songs uh, would, uh, would be taught by, uh, by older musicians to, uh, to the young uh, musicians and so they would uh, perpetuate these uh, family stories of the boyars. It's always the song, I mean, you have these songs always about uh, the Boyar family, and uh, um, here there is a separation somehow that uh, there are um, um, there are also Lotari songs, which are made only for Lotari for their own groups, but th those songs would not play uh, for the boyar, for the noble, for the master. So you have two very separate types of, uh, of songs. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is a, a quote from um, from the memoirs of uh, of a noble, and it's about his family, and uh, he talks about the role of uh, musicians. So um, they would call crow, which is a very derogatory term, which is used nowadays even for Roma people. Um, and um, you can see how um, how this. Uh, love songs uh, were were instrumentalized uh, so um, the song play by the Lothar had to be in a certain voice if not he would is, he would whisper to him that oh you have to sigh at some point uh, because it's a love song and you have to impress and you didn't sigh enough so uh, he would order sigh louder crow. Um, 
This is another boyar. Uh, his name uh, is Aleku Vakarescu. And uh, in the 18th century, he's uh, basically one uh, of the first uh, poets in uh, Romanian literature. He basically collected these songs uh, of his family, these songs created by uh, uh, the family musicians, I mean, the slaves of, of his family. And um, he published this, uh, this collection under his name. So uh, for me, this was a very interesting uh, phenomenon because uh, he took the paternity of the songs. Um, and um, it, there was never a mention of the um, Roma authors, the ones that created these songs, these lyrics, and so on. Um, but on the other hand, uh, because this uh, uh, situation of being a slave was not uh, limited to the body, to the fact that the body was owned by the a boyar, by the noble, it was also the product of the mind. So. Um, in this term, in this sense, uh, the slave owner was also uh, owning uh, the intellectual property of the slave. So what they would produce as intellectual slaves, it would be the property of the owner. So the owner would easily claim authorship. Uh, for this. Um, so, um, in a sense, um, there, um, there was a lack of respect for, uh, for these musicians. Uh, they were treated uh, um, in a, a very um, um, insulting way in many situations. There are so many instances uh, in this abolitionist literature of how bad uh, the, um, the musicians are treated by their owners uh, and how they are punished for all kind of uh, small mistakes and so on. Uh, but they are also very close and they are in the immediate proximity of the owner um, and they give voice to the inner feelings of their owners. Um, they are present in uh, official circumstances, uh, but also at uh, these very personal, very intimate events, and they give somehow voice to, uh, to this private life of their owner, but in a sense, these two worlds never meet. The, uh, the world of the slaves and the world of the um, slave owner. So in this sense, it's, I think it's a good example. Uh, this uh, young noble, Gheorghe Burada, um, who started to play violin, but the violin was seen as a, a degrading musical instrument that only a slave would touch. So it was like a huge scandal that he would give this concert, this violin concert um, by using a slave instrument. Um, so he basically uh, renounced and uh, he stopped playing music for a while. Actually, he, he returned after, after uh, a few decades, so close to, to the boyars as they used to be during slavery. So uh, they are kind of lost. They do not know what is uh, their place in this new society when they do not depend on uh, 
um, this institution of slavery. So uh, there is this story of this most the most important uh, Lothar, the most important musician um, that has to play in a small. Uh, this is a representation of him. Uh, and uh, this is also an actor, an important uh, actor from the, the end, at the end of the 19th century impersonating him as a non-Roma actor. Um, and um, his, um, his skill is now rejected by uh, the young boyars uh, because uh, they are not so much interested uh, in this type of uh, music that they consider as being the music of slavery, or music of the past. Um, but uh, at the same time, they they still have to live. This old uh, old lautar, so uh, they uh, move to villages and. Uh, they perform uh, for peasants. Um, so um, when uh, when Alexandri writes about this old Lautari, he says that um, they are um, somehow anticipating their disappearance. So uh, this Lautari will uh, will somehow uh, disappear and. Um, he he's in this uh, short play that uh, Alexandri wrote about him. Uh, he um, he talks to his uh, instrument, to his musical instrument, uh, the kobza, and uh, uh, he thanks. Uh, the country for freeing the gypsies. I mean, this theme is uh, reoccurring um, all the time when we talk about uh, free slaves uh, in uh, in this literature, and especially in um, in what uh, the abolitionists are saying afterwards. Oh, that uh, the freed slaves would thank us, and they would be. Um, so uh, touched and so uh, impressed that we managed to liberate them. I doubt it somehow that this actually happened, especially because the conditions of uh, of the Roma people after slavery were very harsh, were very difficult because there was no social um plan for for these people in many cases they would uh, and including lautar uh, they would uh, free and they would be uh, kicked out of the noble palace uh without any clothes on and because the clothes and the shoes were owned by the uh, slave owner so you would have these groups of uh, former slaves on the streets uh, uh, moving around, not knowing in what direction or what to do. Uh, so, in this sense, I mean, it was uh, it was quite a big uh, a big problem how this uh, uh, abolition happened. Um, so, for. Uh, for these uh, young boyars uh, of the abolitionist generation, like Alexandri, um, while they are building a new identity from, for themselves, like a new modern identity uh, on the ruins of an old world, this world of their parents, uh, the slave owners, um, they also estimate uh, this idea of uh, forgetting slavery and how uh, important it is uh, that uh, the, the slaves of their 
parents uh, will uh, physically disappear, and with them they will there will be a disappearance of this uh, a shameful history of our noble families and so on. Um, so um, it's always uh, this Lautar uh, that uh, is this, uh, has this destiny to disappear as uh, an element of the past. Uh, and as uh, Barbu Lautaro is saying, I'm going, I'm dying like an old song. Um, so now I will uh, move to this very last part uh, about industrial slaves, which uh, would come also as an answer to this situation. What will happen to, to these uh, free slaves? What is their place in this uh, new society, this, this new modern society? And actually, I, uh, um, I found this uh, story in a, in a collection of uh, steampunk uh, stories from 2011 is called From the Gypsies. And um, actually, there are like a lot of uh, interesting uh, stories connected to the period that I was talking about already. They, re uh, these authors, uh, they uh, reinvent uh, these 19th century stories uh, in a steampunk universe. Well, this uh, particular story from the Gypsies uh, takes place in the, in the 1950s uh, during uh, communism. We, uh, you have a different uh, situation for Romania. You have a, like a sort of Soviet Union. You had purges. Uh, all intellectuals disappeared. All the engineers disappeared in the camps and so on. And uh, the Roma people are the only ones uh, who have uh, technical knowledge. We are talking about industrial communist society, and these Roma people are the ones traveling around, having the only people who have this uh, technical knowledge of how to run these factories uh, and this whole industry. Uh, which is a very interesting idea, but um, and of course, I mean, it's more complicated uh, because they are using quantum physics and alchemy, and their secret is all well kept and so on. I mean, it's a it's a very interesting story, but actually, it's not so new. It's not such a new story. There are a lot of um, ideas. Uh, at, that are uh, uh, discussed uh, already in the 1830s about uh, Roma people and uh, technology and industry. Um, so there are like these uh, utopian perspectives uh, on capitalism, the capitalism that will arrive soon in this uh, agri cultural societies, um, and um, how um, the Roma slaves would become a future working class in this capitalist society where uh, the nobles, these young uh, intellectuals, would become, of course, the future capitalists. They would be the owners of factories and so on. Um, already in 1831, um, through these uh, regulations uh, to um, sedentarize uh, the Roma travelers, the, the Roma nomads, the Romanian nomads, um, the slave owners could get more slaves uh, from the state uh, if uh, they use them as industrial laborers. 
Um, so they were basically having these regulations to uh, to support the uh, local industry with uh, uh, Roma industrial workers. And um, there was a quite a spread idea that uh, actually Roma people are fit uh, to become uh, factory workers in the future, based especially on the stereotypes related to Roma people that are craftsmen, uh, they cannot work the fields, they are not good in agriculture, they know how to work metal, and so on. Um, so um, this development of uh, new industries um, was also related to a future working force. So how uh, can we assure this, uh, this needed uh, working force? And um, the, first, uh, the first solution was, of course, uh, to use the existing Roma slaves. There are also different uh, plans, different projects that were actually not very successful, but uh, they existed and they existed on paper also and uh, as uh, plans um, to create uh, this uh, uh, structures, uh, industrial cooperatives, and uh, this is an example. Um, probably the, the most known, Theodore Diamant, was uh, an intellectual coming from France, and he created uh, a phalanstery based on the uh, writings uh, of the um, utopian socialists like uh, Fourier and Saint-Simon, um, and um, he basically constructed this uh, cooperative, industrial cooperative in a oil extracting area where he basically uh, freed the Roma slaves uh, that were part of the cooperative uh, with the, the agreement of the boyar, who, of the noble who owned the land and so on. I mean, this case is very interesting because he was also blamed afterwards by uh, by the socialist uh, uh, historians, let's say, as a as the first communist in Romania. That that was happening in eighteen thirty five thirty six. He was also sending uh, these reports uh, to the administrative council of Moldavia, and he would uh, propose uh, to organize uh, these uh, colonies, agricultural industrial colonies for Roma people in order to uh, teach them uh, order, economics, morals, and religion. Uh, to make them work in these uh, industrial colonies and so on, but uh, it didn't actually happen this way. He tried also in Valachia, it didn't work. Uh, there were also other projects, uh, for example, from uh, Rukaranu, he also had a plan um, on, uh, on this idea that uh, Roma people are more industrious than Romanians, and um, actually um, they could uh, teach, they could uh, lead uh, this uh, new working force uh, that would uh, eat uh, a new capitalist economy. So these are just plans. At that time you didn't have a real industry. These are like agricultural societies, but they were anticipating somehow. Um, 
as uh, Shannon Woodcock explains, um, the fact uh, that all these plans are based on, uh, on this ethnic identity of the Roma slave um, as, a, as a social category that is controlled, uh, that is uh, a future working class um, functions, especially on, uh, based on stereotypes uh, and uh, how uh, Roma people are perceived in these societies also as the other, as a working class other, or, or as, a, as someone that is uh, uh, ethnically fit uh, to be part uh, of this um, future uh, capitalist order with a very specific uh, subordinate role. Um, this is also connected to the fact that uh, the freed slaves were not uh, included in the agricultural reform. They would not receive land like the peasants did, even if they would work, even if they worked in agriculture before. Um, so um, this was also s somehow a method to find a place for them in society, to integrate them in, into these new uh, arriving industries. It didn't actually happen like this, um, but um, uh, Shannon Woodcock talks about uh, this idea that I think it's very accurate, especially regarding this uh, uh, idea of industrial slaves as uh, they are slaves without a master. Um, especially how uh, these uh, liberated slaves uh, are perceived uh, after slavery. So they, uh, they are still slaves, but they don't have a master. They would work in a factory maintaining their slave identity. Um, so this is the last thing that I want to say. Um, Koganijanu in a discourse, uh, in a speech that he gave uh, in front of the Romanian Academy in 1891 called the Emancipation of the Gypsies, he, and where he talks about their realization, their uh, results, and how did it change society, and so on. Um, he talks uh, about. Uh, I mean, we have to remember that uh, this guy Kokalichanu, very important politician and writer, was the main architect of slavery abolitionism. And he makes this over-enthusiastic statement uh, uh, about uh, the status of the liberated slaves, the Romani people, uh, focusing precisely on uh, their uh, ethnic difference. They are uh, Asian color faces and uh, they have strong imagination. So, this is seen for him still as a problem, even if we can find them in all social groups. Of course, it was not true. They are not. They were not in in all the social uh, groups. And uh, this description, uh, as as flattering as it may sound for uh, for this. Uh, abolitionist and uh, abolitionists and uh, nobles and politicians uh, does not express the huge inequality uh, that existed between Romanians and the uh, Romani population at the end of the 19th century and uh, unfortunately exists even now uh, in connection to, to this long history of oppression. <laughs>
So this is where I stop. If you have any questions, please. Yes, thanks for um, managing to <laughs> stay you, till the end. Thank you to Mihai for, for giving such a detailed introduction to the role of play and the history and the imagination to it. Um, the talk left a bit longer than we thought, so I think we can cancel the Q&A session, but any of you are welcome to stay and to talk to Mihai if you have any questions.